hopefully have the answers. And the first question is, who is at greater risk for lupus nephritis? And it turns out it is men. We talked this morning how surprising this seems, since you would think men would be protected against more severe illness. And in the United States, African Americans are at greater risk. How should we be measuring renal activity in clinical research or even perhaps in our own practice? The Systemic Lupus International Collaborating Clinics, using regression analysis of real patients, came up with a renal activity score. This weights different degrees of proteinuria and weights hematuria higher than pyuria to come up with a total score. But the gold standard is still kidney biopsy, not just to determine the ISN class, but also because we want to know the degree of activity and the degree of damage. Activity can make such a difference in our clinical response. If a patient has lots of crescents on a kidney biopsy, for example, I think all of us are going to want to start out with intravenous methylprednisolone pulse therapy as well as either cytoxin or salsa. How should we detect lupus nephritis? And the goal here is, of course, to detect it early. This morning I mentioned that the spot or random urine protein creatinine ratio is very useful. It correlates quite highly with a 24-hour urine protein. I do want to mention now, though, two caveats. The first is, please order protein and not microalbumin. If you measure the microalbumin to creatinine ratio, you will only determine 50% of the total protein in the urine. And the second caveat is that there is a circadian rhythm. Urine protein is higher in the morning. Ultimately, though, we all wish we had urine biomarkers of disease activity, so we wouldn't have to do kidney biopsies. We'd be able to determine whether the patient was responding to treatment or whether they were flaring just by measuring something in the urine. Many groups have devoted a lot of time to trying to find urinary biomarkers for lupus nephritis. I will tell you that in my experience, the best one on this list may actually be VCAM. We have to be very careful about cross-sectional studies. We really need these urinary biomarkers to be measured longitudinally to see if they do correlate well with changes in urine protein, and also whether kidney biopsies are done to see if they correlate with the kidney biopsy findings. For both of those, VCAM1 has met the definition. Now, how should you and I treat proteinuria when it's due to active lupus nephritis? I wanted to mention that one of the most important things that we should all do is to borrow from nephrology. We need to have our patients on renal sparing regimens because these can reduce proteinuria by 50% even before we add immunosuppressive drugs. We are very aggressive doing this at Hopkins. We increase the renal steroid regimen until the systolic blood pressure is 100. I mentioned this morning how important it is to continue hydroxychloroquine because it can triple the complete response rate to either salsa or cyclophosphamide. I think all of us in rheumatology do this, but I know that in nephrology they do not. We have had a revolution in immunosuppressive treatment for lupus nephritis. It's one of the greatest success stories in rheumatology, the development of mycophenolate for lupus nephritis. And of course, the story started with Professor T.M. Chan's trial in the Journal Journal of Medicine. He compared mycophenolate with oral cyclophosphamide. You can see the very high complete response rate with both regimens. Now, obviously, more toxicity with oral cyclophosphamide. Now, I have a rule that I teach rheumatology fellows. It is not worth saving the kidneys if you kill the patient. And the problem with the oral cyclophosphamide was that 10% of the young women on that arm died. 
So I certainly don't re recommend oral cyclophosphamide for lupus nephritis. It's just too toxic. In the United States, we also did a trial of mycophenolate. But here, the other arm was intravenous cyclophosphamide every month, what we call the NIH regimen. Please notice that in the United States, our patients don't do nearly as well as patients in China. Do you see how low our complete response rates are? By the way, isn't this shocking? Only a 6% complete response rate to NIH cytoxia. I don't think we knew how bad the complete response rate was. Now remember, of course, the longer you keep patients on these regimens, the more will respond. But to prevent renal failure, your goal is a quick complete response rate. The quicker the patient responds, the more kidney function will be retained. I wanted to summarize the induction studies and point out the recent meta-analysis confirming that for induction, mycophenolate and cyclophosphamide are equal. There is one corollary to that. It does appear that African Americans do better with mycophenolate. What about maintenance? This was the first clinical trial of maintenance therapy, and it showed that both azathioprine and mycophenolate were better than intravenous cyclophosphamide. I think this was the trial that buried cyclophosphamide for lupus nephritis. It isn't our first choice anymore, for good reason. Here is a list of all the major maintenance trials. I wanted to spend some time on the ALMS trial because it isn't yet published, and it did reach an important result that mycophenolate was superior to azathioprine really quite different from the previous studies. This one I think should be the gold standard because it was the largest and it was international. Not too many patients were retained till the end though. At least more patients were retained on mycophenolate than azathioprine. In fact, one of the major reasons for patients to withdraw from the mycophenolate arm was the desire to become pregnant because we forbid mycophenolate in pregnancy due to a 25% rate of fetal malformation. There was a very complicated composite endpoint in the OMS trial, but you can see that mycophenolate was statistically superior to azathioprine on the first two, and came close on the last two. So really a very powerful trial. There weren't very many adverse events. In fact, there was only one death with the azathioprine arm. So both of these therapies were well tolerated. However, no kidney biopsies. And we know that the kidney biopsy is still the gold standard. So I wanted to show you one clinical trial that included kidney biopsies that may be a little bit disturbing to us. Because in this study, but in the Netherlands, the kidney biopsies on the patients who are on cyclophosphamide were better, meaning less increase in chronicity, than those that had received azathioprine. But bottom line is, it's almost impossible to do repeat kidney biopsies in a clinical trial, especially if the patient is doing well. It's hard to justify the cost and the risk. How can you and I predict response to treatment? Since not everyone will do well on mycophenolate, how do we know we should switch to something else? Here are the biomarkers from the ALMS trial that predicted response at eight weeks, so quite early. Normalization of complement and a 25% reduction in proteinuria. What would I do if I started a patient on mycophenolate and they weren't improving by week eight? I normally start mycophenolate at 1,000 twice a day, I would be increasing to 1,500 twice a day if the patient didn't show some response by week eight. <clears throat> now, most of the trials concentrated on only <coughs> proliferative nephritis. So a major question that you and I will have, is membranous different? 
Some people think, for example, that membranes should be treated less aggressively. I wanted to show you that in my cohort, membranous is not benign. You can see in terms of nephrotic syndrome and thrombosis, membranous is still a bad outcome disease. We separated membranous into pure membranous and a mixed membranous, meaning that the patient had active serology. I want to again acknowledge Dr. Kazatana from Thailand who did so much of the renal work with me during her fellowship. There was absolutely no difference. It didn't matter whether the person had pure or mixed membranes in terms of their response to microphenolate over 12 months. But here is what does matter. If a patient has membranes and they're nephrotic, they're just not going to do well. Only 11% will have a complete remission. What this means to me is that we should detect membranous early, way before the patient is nephrotic, and treat, and I would argue, with microphenolate early. I wanted to show you a meta-analysis of all the treatment studies of membranous, and it's quite clear if you look at complete response that steroids alone are not the answer. You really do need to add another drug. But you see of all the other drugs, they really appear to be quite equal. So the meta-analysis can't pick one over the other. So membranous can't be thought to be a benign form of lupus nephritis. The patients eventually do have impaired renal function. Of course, they become hypercoagulable and they become hyperlipidemic. What are we going to do differently for lupus nephritis? I mentioned this morning that we have the opportunity to identify targeted biologics. We're not sure exactly what pathways to pick. We have so many different opportunities. But remember, for non-renal lupus, it appears that the B cell pathways have been most successful in development so far. However, renal trials have been astoundingly negative. And I wanted to mention abetimus, which was a B cell collagen to prevent antibody strand DNA, and the rituximab lunar trial, both completely negative. So, what about the new biologic that was just approved for lupus in the United States last month? Belimumab targets the B lymphocyte stimulator protein. In the two phase three belimumab trials, patients with active lupus nephritis were actually excluded. So no one at this point in time can recommend this new biologic for lupus nephritis. But some of the findings in the phase three trials are of interest in that they might be applicable to lupus nephritis. And the first is that belimumab leads to a rapid and sustained reduction in anti-double strand DNA. Now, I don't want you to think that I believe anti-double-stranded DNA is the most important autoantibody in lupus nephritis. It is definitely found in the kidneys, obviously, in kidney biopsies. But I actually think that anti-C1Q is a better autoantibody marker for lupus nephritis. Unfortunately, there are no data on anti-C1Q in the balloon med trials. Balloon med does decrease all flares and decreases severe flares, but there weren't enough renal flares to show a difference between belimumab and placebo for renal. Autoantibodies, in addition to anti-double-stranded DNA, were reduced in this trial, including anti-Smith and anti-cardiolipin and anti-ribosomal P. Again, data that are suggested. The companies that are marketing Molimumab in the United States and Europe, including Genome Sciences and GlaxoSmithKline, have made a commitment to a lupus nephritis trial to be done post-marketing. What went wrong with rituximab? Here's an example where we just cannot trust case series. Because there were several case series that suggested that rituximab had benefit for renal lupus. But they were small. And when it came to the randomized trial, there was no benefit of rituximab when added on top of mycophenolate. Now, we still do sometimes use rituximab as rescue therapy in patients who 
are refractory to microphthalate or it could be a cyclophosphamide. But it's not going to be the answer for all patients with lupus nephritis. So where do I think the future is for lupus nephritis? I do think we will add biologics to microphthalate. First of all, because especially in the United States, we have so many refractory patients. But also because the goal of lupus nephritis is to achieve a complete response very rapidly. Not by six months, by one month. We hopefully will soon be able to track renal disease activity without renal biopsies. And that's the goal of the urinary biomarkers. Remember, some of them appear to be promising. They simply have to be tested in larger data sets. And finally, though the answer probably won't come from rheumatology, we have to prevent renal fibrosis because this is what leads to renal failure. Although ACE inhibitors and antitensin receptor blockers are helpful, they simply aren't sufficient. We need better therapies for renal fibrosis. Thank you.